Hey guys, so we are moving on to the next kingdom in the domain eukaryote, Kingdom Plantae. We're going to be looking at the evolution, structures, and adaptations of plants. So as always, please make sure you are filling in your notes organizer as you watch the video, being sure to answer every question. So if we're talking about the kingdom plantae, let's start by talking about what is a plant? What are the characteristics that they all have in common? So first and foremost, they belong to the domain eukarya, which means that all plants are eukaryotic. Their cells have a nucleus and they have those specialized membrane-bound organelles. All plants are multicellular, meaning they're, they're made up of many cells. All plants are autotrophic, meaning they make their own food through the process of photosynthesis. And all plants are made up of specialized tissues and organs. And then finally, all plants are able to absorb nutrients through roots or root-like structures called rhizoids, which we'll get to in a minute. So we're going to be discussing the evolution of plants. How did we get from plant-like protists to plants? So there's a great deal of evidence that supports this theory that plants and algae, or plant-like protists, share a common ancestor. Our algae, or plant-like protists, are probably the you know, origin of modern-day plants. There, the evidence that supports this is the fact that they have a lot in common. So some of the things that they have in common are that both plant-like protists, algae, and plants have cell walls made of cellulose. That during cell division, during mitosis, they have a cell plate that forms and becomes a cell wall. They have chlorophyll, which is a pigment used in photosynthesis, and they store food as starch. The biggest difference is that plant-like protists don't have specialized tissues or organs which means that they require moisture full time because they don't have the tissues that can um, help them live without it. So algae require full time moisture. So we're going to be looking at how do plants evolve to go from needing moisture full time to not having specialized tissues to having specialized tissues and being able to live on dry ground. So here's our big idea. Over time, plants evolve to be able to inhabit land, dry ground. So write both of these sort of pathways down in the box under number three. We went from algae, which are plant-like protists, to our first plants, which are called non-vascular plants. Then we formed our vascular plants. Our first vascular plants are called vascular seeded plants. Then we evolved seeds, so we have seeded vascular plants. And then down here, this is showing the same pathway, it's just giving an example of each one of these things up here. So we went from algae to non-vascular plants, such as mosses, to vascular seedless plants, such as ferns, then to our seeded vascular plants. Our first seeded vascular plants are called gymnosperms, and then our final seeded vascular plants, our flowering plants, are called angiosperms. And we're going to talk about each of these, so don't stress out that you don't know what these words mean. So our first true plants to evolve were our non-vascular plants, so they evolved from algae. So typically they are very small and they still require a great deal of moisture so they grow in damp shady areas because they don't have vascular tissue and vascular tissue is, are these specialized tissues for transporting materials. They also don't have true roots so since they don't have vascular tissue and they don't have true roots they have to grow very low to the ground where the moisture is available and they're going to grow in very damp areas. And then they still use spores for reproduction. So we haven't evolved seeds yet. So these are plants that don't have seeds. They reproduce with spores. Our example, our most common example is going to be mosses. These are the ones you're going to see most often. But there are also these plants called liverworts, which you might have seen before. So these are examples of non-vascular plants. They are true plants. They have specialized, or they have tissues and, and organs, but they don't have specialized vascular tissues for transporting materials. Mosses and liverworts, uh, they don't have true roots, but they do have root-like structures called rhizoids. So like roots, they anchor them to the soil or to you know, some sort of surface, and they allow water and minerals to diffuse through them. So they require diffusion, they require osmosis, but they're not really specialized like roots are. So non-vascular plants, mosses and liverworts, for example, are the most primitive of our land plants. They were the first to evolve from algae. So now we have non-vascular plants. So now we are going to evolve to our vascular plants. So over time, plants evolved specialized vascular tissues. And a vascular tissue is essentially the plumbing system of a plant. They're almost like these little pipes that allow for materials to transport through them. So they carry water, they carry dissolved substances, nutrients throughout the plant, which means, so these are the benefits, um, 5A, you can move materials faster, 
Roots can grow deeper, which means, means they can get water that's deeper, not just on the surface. And they provide structure and support to the plant, meaning that the plant can physically grow bigger. So our two types of vascular tissues, these tissues used for transporting materials, are xylem and phloem. Coolest names ever, right? There's a phrase I want you to remember. Xylem up, phloem down. Xylem up, phloem down. So xylem is the vascular tissue that moves materials up. So think about what would be going up in a plant. Well, it would be coming from the bottom, which is where the roots are. What comes in through the roots? Water. So xylem is the vascular tissue responsible for moving water up through the plant. And then phloem is the vascular tissue responsible for moving materials down the plant. So what moves down from the leaves? Well, the leaves capture all the sunlight, so that's where a lot, the most of photosynthesis happens. And the point of photosynthesis is to make sugar, to make glucose. So the xylem, or sorry, phloem, flows down the sugars made from photosynthesis. So xylem water up, phloem sugar is down. Xylem up, phloem down. And just think about what's coming from those areas. So our first vascular plants to evolve were seedless vascular plants. So they have vascular tissues, so they can grow a little bigger, they can move materials faster, but they haven't yet evolved seeds, okay? They have true roots, but they still reproduce with spores. Our most well-known seedless vascular plants are ferns. You've probably heard of them before, but they're also club mosses and horsetails. So here's some pictures. So right now at Kroger and Home Depot, Ferns are becoming huge, right? Starting to get springtime, they sell ferns because everyone loves to have them on their porch here in Georgia. If you go and you look at these ferns and you flip the, the frond, is what the leaf is called, if you flip the frond upside down, you might see structures that look like this. These are the spores on the underside of the leaf. Okay, so we haven't evolved seeds yet, still reproducing with spores. So now we're going to move on to our seeded vascular plants. The seed is a super important structure that evolved over the history of plants. Let's talk about why it was important. Seeds were the final structure that allowed plants to make the move to true dry ground. So roots helped, the vascular tissues helped, allowed us to move from you know needing to grow in areas that were really moist to areas that were drier, but it was really the seed that made that final jump. So draw a seed and label its major structure as under number 7A. The parts of a seed are the embryo, which is going to grow into the plant, the nutrients that are going to feed the embryo, it's going to consume that, and then the protective outer seed coat. This is a very simplistic diagram of a seed. Now seeds can be dispersed in many ways, meaning they can be spread out in a lot of ways. They can be carried by the wind, carried by the water, carried by animals, and the benefit of dispersing your seeds is that it limits the competition between parent and offspring. If they just dropped their seeds right where they are and there was no way of spreading them out, then those plants would grow and now they're competing mommy plant and baby plant, right? Which is not good. We want to spread them out. Hopefully we limit competition and we can all survive and grow. So, so here are some ways that seeds can be dispersed. We've all seen the little helicopter seeds that come spinning down from the maple seeds. Um, dandelion seeds float off, they're carried by the wind. If you've had a burr stuck to your sock, that's another way that um, seeds can be dispersed. We know that seeds can be carried by animals when they're eaten and then they poop them out, right, somewhere else, so that's how they're dispersed. We know that some seeds, like coconuts, which is a seed of a palm tree, can float, right, can be carried by the water. And then we have our first seeded vascular plants. So we've gone from non-vascular plants to vascular plants but still reproduce with spores to our first seeded vascular plants which are called gymnosperms. These, it means naked seeds. So the seeds are not really protected in any way. They're still sort of exposed to the elements and they are carried in cones. So a gymnosperm is a cone bearing plant. That is where they carry their seeds. So now our examples of gymnosperms, there's actually many types. Um, these are our conifers, our cone-bearing plants. These you may be kind of unfamiliar with. They're called neophytes, cycads, or ginkgos, which you may have heard about. But these are all examples of gymnosperms, plants that carry their seeds in cones. Then came our final step in plant evolution, which was the evolution of the flower. Okay, these are angiosperms. So angiosperms, whenever I say that term, I want you to immediately think of flower because these are flowering plants. So these were the last seeded vascular plants to evolve. And this adaptation, this being able to produce a flower and carry their seeds in flowers, 
allowed them to live well in both terrestrial and aquatic environments. And because this is such a great adaptation, angiosperms actually end up making up about 75% of the plant kingdom. Okay, so angiosperm adaptation, flowering plant adaptations. Why flowers? Why is this such a good thing? Well, first of all, the seeds aren't naked anymore. Inside the ovary of a flower, you have eggs. When the pollen comes in and fertilizes the egg, it forms into a seed, and that ovary becomes a fruit, right? So seeds are now protected in fruit. Flowers attract pollinators, and the pollen is the sperm of the plant, kind of weird to think about, but the sperm can be carried by the pollinators, so by being able to move it all around, chances are it's going to land on something and fertilize it. So by, by having a flower, you attract the pollinators, which makes you more likely to have your eggs fertilized. Okay, so here's some different angiosperms attracting pollinators. So think about what would attract them. The color, the fragrance, okay, and they're going to get that pollen sort of on their little hairs, right, and carry it to different flowers. So now take a minute, you may need to pause on this slide, to draw and label the structure of a flower for number 10. Here's a typical looking flower. They don't all look like this. But this structure right here is the female portion of the flower called a pistil. So this part right here, that's a pistil. All of these little things right here, that is, those are the male portions of the flower. Those are called the stamen. Okay, that should be easy to remember. Stamen, the male portion of the flower. And then pistil, I don't know, you can think of like that girl is as fiery as a pistil. Okay, that's the female portion of the flower. So the stamen is made up of the filament this little part right here, and the anther, which has the pollen, and the pollen is like the sperm of a flower. The female portion, the pistil, is made of the stigma, which is the sticky part up here. Why would a stigma need to be sticky? Sticky stigma. That's where the pollen would land. Then it would travel down the style, this little tube right here, and then it would, it would make its way to the ovary where the eggs are. So take a minute to label, draw and label the structures of a flower. Pause on that if you need to. Okay, then you should be familiar with just some general uh, structures of plants. So for example, the leaves of plants, which is going to be where you're going to find the majority of chloroplasts. So this is where photosynthesis takes place because they're really good at trapping sunlight. Then you have the flower, which is the reproductive part, right? It's, can, it's going to produce seeds after pollination. The ovary will become the fruit. Then you have stems, which have those vascular tissues, so they allow for water and food to travel throughout the plant and also to help the plant stay upright. And then finally, we have roots, which are going to be used to anchor the plant and allow for the traveling of materials. And you should be familiar with this diagram. Um, it's a picture of a plant cell. The major plant cell structures that you are responsible for knowing that we have talked about many times are that outer cell wall outside of the cell membrane used for structure and support. And then also the chloroplast, which is going to be where photosynthesis takes place. And then remember, plant cells have that large central vacuole used for storing water. When vacuole, vacuoles are filled, the plant is upright. When your flowers start to look, you know, a little limp, that's because those vacuoles have emptied. So that's our last slide, but you still have two questions left, question 13 and question 14. Use your notes to answer those two questions. To use your notes on the video check, you do have to have those two questions answered. I hope you're having a great day.